All right. Well, it is 1.30, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, and before I get started, I wanted to take a moment to recognize an, another uh, foundation um, that has really brought us together with Dr. Geller today. Um, to and, and their their initiative is to, well, <clears throat> let me say, uh, the Joey Wing, Joey's Wings Foundation was established in 2014 in the memory of Joey Zhu, who was taken from us by XP11.2 translocation renal cell carcinoma in November 26th of 2014. And their mission is to fund research that focuses on kidney cancers affecting children and young adults, raise awareness and provide support to families affected by childhood cancer. 100% of all donations made are, is used to fund research and treatment options, patients care and advocacy for developing less toxic therapies to treat kidney cancer among children and young adults. So if you get a moment, please visit joeywings.org for more details on their organization. And they were uh, the ones who put us in contact with Dr. Geller today, and we're very excited to have him with us. Dr. Geller, thank you for being here. Could you please share with us a little bit about what you do? Oh, sure, let's make, yeah, I'm not muted. So my name is Jim Geller, I'm a pediatric oncologist. Um, I, from the audience, I know that a, a, a couple of you may, may, we may have met before, but I, I uh, lead, I'm the medical director here in Cincinnati for our kidney and liver tumor programs. And I have vested interest in new drug development as well as <clears throat> specifically for the, for pediatric oncology, uh, trying to champion efforts around renal cell carcinoma, working with our adult colleagues and so on. So very interested in trying to partner with those who, who are interested in trying to make a difference. And um, that's who I am. Awesome, thank you for being here. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. You should be able to now with the, the green share button. Yep. Awesome. Yep, we see it now. I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight your video. Oh, before we get started, and anybody, we're um, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. Uh, Dr. Geller has been nice enough to, uh, to he, he'd like to answer all your questions today. So if anything comes up, feel free to ask in the chat box and, and we'll pause for a moment and, and answer those questions. So uh, without further ado, uh, could take it away, Dr. Geller. Well, thank you. And thanks to the uh, Scott for helping coordinate this and to the Judy Nicholson Kidney Cancer Foundation, uh, to Kathy uh, for helping uh, of Joey's Wings for bringing me into this. I do enjoy uh, meeting uh, parents, patients, advocates, other stakeholders and working to advance things. And I think one of the things that you'll see today is that that partnership makes a difference and it's important. Your voices are important and, uh, and impactful. I'll show an example of, or two of how that's happened over the years. Uh, my goal today is to just give you all, um, given that I was uh, anticipating a broad audience of different backgrounds, um, a flavoring of what pediatric renal tumors is about. Um, and um, I will go over just a brief intro to give a flavoring sort of appetizers as we go through. But I also wanted people to understand what the Children's Oncology Group, uh, the Renal Tumor Committee does, and how we've centralized care in pediatrics, which is a little different than some of the adult work. And then we will uh, close by spending time on the, on the pediatric version of renal cell carcinoma called translocation renal cell carcinoma. So in thinking through solid tumors to the kidney and kids, there is probably a list of 30 other tumors that I could have put here. Um, people think of Wilms tumor first, second, and third, and then maybe renal cell and sarcomas and rhabdoid tumors after. But we do see a wide array of cancer in kids in the kidney. I'm gonna go quickly just because I wanna again give you a flavor and not, not for anyone to be tested at the end. Um, so occasionally I will get called 
to, uh, to meet a mother who has not yet given birth to her child and consult on behalf of our maternal fetal program because sometimes kidney tumors in children are diagnosed before they're born. Uh, this is a mesoblastic nephroma diagnosed in utero where that M is. Hopefully you can see my arrow. And this is the most common form of kidney tumors that people can be born with. Typically presents in the first three to six months of life. And more often than not, when it's resected in time, uh, is, is benign. This is a 15-month-old <clears throat> who presented with a rather large, what looks like a bunch of cysts replacing that left kidney. It's called a multi-cystic cystic nephroma. Cystic nephromas are more known to occur in adult women, but we do see them in children, often associated with a gene called DICER1, which is something we didn't know anything about until about 10 years ago. Um, this is another example of a benign tumor, despite how large it looks, but typically does require resection. I'm just trying to give you all a flavor of some of the rare nuances before we get into the uh, more common ones. This is an example of nephroblastomatosis. This is a complete uh, enlargement of both kidneys where they maintain the fetal architecture of the, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the kidneys from an in utero look. They haven't quite matured yet, and they have these, uh, it fills the belly. This is not polycystic kidney disease. Um, these kidneys, uh, about 100% of the time, if it's called the diffuse hyperplastic top type will go on to develop Wilms tumor in the kidney, or sometimes they develop what's called nephrogenic rests, which are precursors to Wilms tumor. And we have to monitor these children every few months for six, seven years of their, of their life for the development of this. And in fact, sometimes treat preemptively. So that was really to give you a flavor of things that this audience probably hasn't thought about before. And now I'm going to turn to, to just that was really just to give you again a flavoring to turn about how, how we handle things centrally within this country for pediatric kidney cancer. A little bit of history the National Women's Tumor Study Group was established as one of the original cooperative groups by the NCI. It was among the first four cooperative groups in children and nine adults. And the National Women's Tumor Study Group conducted five studies in about uh, 40, 35 years. Sorry. So here, this is an important message. Um, the children's and the National Wounds Tumor Study Group from 1969 to 2002 enrolled more than 10,000 kids with kidney cancer on trials. When you think about the fact that in 2020, we have about 450 Wilms tumors per year, about 600 kidney cancers per year in total, this means that we enrolled more than 90% of all kids with kidney tumors on our national trials. And these were clinical trials, which proves that you can study rare diseases if you collaborate. We developed a lot of insights from these trials. In 2000, we did merge and we joined uh, the other three pediatric groups and formed the children oncology group. And the first study that we formed was the uh, ARN O3B2 biology and banking study. This was launched to centralize the assessment of pediatric kidney cancer through a, a coordinated effort by our renal tumor committee to support four clinical trials, three of which included, well, all four included Wilms tumors, but three dedicated to Wilms tumors and one dedicated to other cancers. So the goals of this study were to uh, assess via histology, stage, metastases, age, the tumor weight, and some biological features of the tumor, the patient's risk, and to define their eligibility. We did maintain a biobank, and we did annotate these biospecimens. Despite this, the burdensome requirements for submissions, all the centers did submit nearly everything that was required of them, including images and pathology and so on. So, this was presented in ASCO 2015. We do a real-time review with pathology, radiology, and surgery, and ultimately an oncologist defines the initial risk assignment. 
Um, Dr. Elizabeth Mullen has been study chair and I've been vice chair for the last 10 years or so. So the two of us basically assigned the risk to every kid, every kid for a long time, figure out what trial they would be eligible for. The study opened in 2006, it closed down for a couple years recently, but it has been reactivated as of the last week because our next series of studies have opened. We've accrued more than 6,500 kids. About 80% of them are Wilms tumor, and the other 20% make up all the other diagnoses. Excuse the sounds in the background, by the way. I have uh, three remote schoolers and, uh, and two dogs and a spouse working from home, so I do welcome your questions and interruptions as long as you tolerate mine. <laughs> in truth, I do want to hear your questions as we go. We decided to do a, a feasibility of our real-time central review. This was presented to the adult cooperative groups. And to remind the audience, the National Wilms Tumor Study Group, again, was one of the first cooperative groups to successfully conduct prospective clinical studies in, in, in cancer, kids or adults. And our goal was to complete our, our complete review within 14 days. Most of our reviews were completed within a day and a half of receiving all the specimens and, and images. We had a median of eight days. And we looked at concordance between central review and institutional review of the imaging, of the pathology, of the surgery. And in the first 3,000 patients, we found 1,205 discrepancies. And um, when we looked further about whether these discrepancies impacted clinical risk assignment, meaning which trial or how they would be treated on a certain trial, 10% of the 3,000 patients overall V essentially review had a clinical treatment modification because of the central review process. This data again is the largest series of its kind, kids or adults, showing the importance of central review when things are rare. So to conclude from our centralization process, um, enrollment has been very strong nationally. People are cooperating. <clears throat> we were successful in doing central review in a timely manner. We've had over 1,700 patients enrolled on our COG renal tumor studies to this pathway. And the discrepancies were uh, common, but uh, communicated in real time, such that we could impact and help institutions who don't see this as often. There's a ton of people to acknowledge from the central review process. Dr. Mullen, who was the chair, Dr. Gracious, who was a vice chair for a while with me, Paul Grundy and Jeff Dome, the former uh, Renal Tumor Committee chairs, and a list of about 25 people who've participated in the central process by now. So during that process, we, uh, um, we conducted our clinical trials from that slide that I showed you with the arrows going to three different Wilms tumor studies and one study, the 0321 study that included renal cell carcinoma. We have completed all those studies. This is the first wave of COG studies. And we're now on to our second wave of COG studies, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more now. <clears throat> the next favorable histology Wilms tumor study is being run by Dr. Mullen, and she has three uh, sub-vice chairs for the different arms of that one single study. That study has not opened yet. For the relapse Wilms and the higher risk histologies of kidney cancer in kids, those have been overseen by me, which is why I think Kathy asked me to come and speak with all of you, because that does include renal cell carcinoma with Vice Chair Nick Cost of an open trial, which we'll talk about. And it also includes anaplastic Wilms, the more aggressive kind, and relapsed histology Wilms with uh, my Vice Chair from Baylor, Raj Venkatramani. And I've been mentoring Dr. Amy Waltz in Chicago, who's overseeing the development of the rhabdoid study. I spend most of the time talking about these two studies, the RCC study and the anaplastic and relapse wound study shortly. Before I go there, um, a lot of the common questions come up is why do kids develop kidney cancer? And most of the time it's we don't know why, but for Wilms tumor, about five to 10%, we can identify a risk factor. There's about 50 to 60 different genetic conditions linked to Wilms tumor. The ones that have been most best characterized are the ones with Wilms tumor one gene mutation called Wagger or Denny's Drash syndrome, or those with the Wilms tumor two gene or the Beckwith-Wiedemann gene, 
uh, affected. But there is um, a literally 50 to 60 conditions genetically identified and linked to Wilms tumor. There's also been some familial Wilms tumor genes. But the genetics of the Wilms tumor themselves, the, the cancers, not the children, are prognostic and used in our risk stratification modeling. So this, I, I thought I would pause. I haven't peeked at the chat room just to see if people would like to ask questions about pediatric renal tumors and our central processes and our Wilms tumor stuff. I'm more than happy to take one or two questions now before moving on to the, to the next two trials, which is, and some of the new, new drug stuff, which is where, where my personal interests and, 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 uh, and roles have been. Okay. I, I'm going through it fairly quickly again, because I, I want to keep your interest and hopefully give you that flavor. But also, I really would like to have the dialogue afterwards. So I hope that you all will stay on and, uh, and join me. Um, for study AREN 1921, this study was just activated on Friday, September 18th, 2020, after about six or seven years of, of development. The anaplastic wilms look more aggressive. Their, their cells look more aggressive compared to what's, what's called favorable histology wilms. And this study, has been activated for our anaplastic Wilms tumors, those more aggressive ones, as well as for those that have the favorable Wilms, but for whom they've had a relapse. So this is what's called our high-risk Wilms protocol. We have a regimen called regimen UH3, which I will show you just to give you a flavor, and a regimen called cyclotopo and ice for the higher risk relapses. What this slide shows is that over the last series of trials for anaplastic wilms, we've had a stage per stage improvement in outcomes as we've intensified our therapy. But this regimen was fairly intense with a toxic related mortality of about three to 4%. And despite that, there was more cures overall, but we have kind of broached our tolerance about how aggressive we can be. And certainly we need to improve outcomes for our stage four patients, all of our patients. Until these are hundreds, we need to keep working. But this was our most recent study and we were able to show an improvement, not the stage four, for sure. This is what the regimen looks like. And it's a 42 week regimen that includes uh, six different drugs. It includes surgery, it includes radiation, and it's not kind. Now, some kids do well, and the majority of the time they're out of the hospital. Some kids have a rough go, and more than half the time they're in the hospital. Um, and for curing the majority of the lower stage, but only half of the stage four patients, um, we'd like to kind of do something a little better. Now we have, this is the newest regimen. We've tweaked it a little bit to improve the tolerance. We move the arenatecan in differently with radiation, and we hope that some of the side effects will be less with how we've timed things, particularly surgery and radiation and some of the chemotherapy cassettes, but it's still an aggressive long regimen. Now, I mentioned that we're also treating patients with relapse Wilms tumors on this study. They have to have the favorable histology kind. We really don't have good options for relapse anaplastic Wilms, and for those, we look at new drugs. We define the risk at relapse based on how aggressive you were treated the first time, because those initial risk factors from the beginning and how aggressively you were treated do impact how difficult it is for cure the second time. If you've only received two drugs up front, four to five times the overall survival is closer to 80%. We can actually cure a child with relapsed favorable histology wilms. It's less than half though, for those kids who've had more than two drugs initially. And we don't even know the data for those who've had more than three drugs initially. So for those who relapsed, those patients who've had just the two drugs, we still think that an event-free survival of 71% philosophically needs to be improved upon. And if we have room and, and it's tolerable, we're gonna escalate and we have. The regimen that we showed you is what we're gonna be using. And for high and very high risk relapse, uh, we're using that ice cyclotopo regimen. And that regimen is a shorter but, but more brutal regimen 
it's a 30 week regimen, but often takes about 35 weeks to give. Uh, and it's and is a bit rougher, but we get kids through it. Uh, did you guys just lose the slideshow? No, sir, we can still see it. Okay, I lost it on that screen. So I, I'm going to turn my head, I apologize. So the, the exploratory endpoints, we are looking at kidney injury biomarkers. We're looking at minimal residual disease, and we are advancing liquid biopsies in pediatric kidney cancer and trying to figure out how to use them. We're looking at some biological uh, issues, some surgical endpoints, and we are advancing centralized quality assured uh, um, intensity modulated radiation to spare kidney and heart uh, and liver uh, within the protocol itself centrally. So these are things that we've been able to do. So um, Scott, I do see your question about are there any side effects to treatment for Wilms tumor? <clears throat> Can these treat treatments affect the child's development? First, let me acknowledge Conrad Fernandez, the current chair of the Renal Tumor Committee, Raj Vikatramani, my vice chair on this recent study that was activated, Dr. Mullen for her work on the Biobank and the Biology Study, and Peter Ehrlich, the leader of surgery for our committee, John Calpercrow, the leader of radiation oncology for our committee and our entire committee, Stu Goldstein, who's here with me in Cincinnati, is an amazing kidney uh, nephrologist who does all the kidney injury biomarkers, Amy Waltz and Brian Crompton, Amy's in Chicago, Brian's in Boston, doing the minimal residual disease work. And of course, Dr. Elizabeth Perlman, who many of you may have heard of, who does the PAT, who leads our pathology initiative with a few others. So before I go on to, um, to the rest of the talk, which is about novel drugs and renal cell carcinoma, we did activate area 1921. The anticipated late effects from Wilms tumor therapy um, we do see when you get two drugs and you don't need any radiation, in our survivor end results series or the childhood cancer survivor series, we are seeing that these survivors have uh, matched outcomes, neurocognitively, emotionally, physically, marital, job, education of their matched siblings. So we're not seeing the late effects from those two drugs. When you add in the third drug called doxorubicin, about 0.5%, one in 200, will develop a second cancer, a leukemia, and combined with radiation to the lung, about one to 2% will develop heart effects. And we are using heart protection medicine now more, more routinely and uh, tweaking down the doxorubicin dose more regularly. With the more aggressive regimens with the cyclophosphamide and the ifosfamide, we do now standardize fertility consultation. We have an uncle fertility workforce within the renal tumor committee and um, there, with the more aggressive regimens, ovarian, uh, ovary uh, sampling or sparing and uh, testicular biopsy are considered because fertility is not a guarantee. Now, that being said, I just treated a 18 year old or 19 year old with the most aggressive regimen. And a year and a half later, she had a baby. So you can never predict. Um, we don't see neurocognitive consequences to this therapy. Uh, um, and school integration tends to go smoothly. Um, so if you can be spared the late, on, the late effects as far as the cancers and the fertility impacts and the heart stuff, um, usually you do fine. In fact, signal kidney, there still seems to be an anticipated full lifespan. Yes, Courtney, I'm happy to. So this is the stage two slide. And um, we have biomarkers called 1Q gain and LOH1P16Q, that's loss of heterozygosity. And we know, and I didn't show all the data, although I actually have it on an add-on slide, when you have those biological features in the tumor, your rates of relapse more than triple. They're still below 30% or around that, but we do think that uh, triaging care and adding another drug makes sense for those that are at high risk. Sorry, my son was singing. I had to tell him to stop. Other questions about what I've presented so far? Okay. So where we are now, and before I move on to the RCC, one of the things that I've done for the Renal Tumor Committee was um, 
was their liaison to the new drug development, their developmental therapeutics committee for the first 15 years of COGS renal tumor committee was also the liaison to the pediatric preclinical testing consortium to represent renal tumors, uh, the developmental therapeutics committee, the pediatric match tar target, or, uh, target prioritization committee, uh, monthly calls with the DDL, the, the phase one group, uh, myself and the chair of the committee. And now I'm, uh, Dr. Wallace has moved in and, and Dr. Mike Ortiz at, at Sloan Kettering is doing some good work. So we're, we're mentoring them into more of a leadership role. During that process, I had the opportunity to chair three phase one, two studies that came to COG through the renal tumor pathway and actually largely through the RCC pathway. And um, this is where we get to some of the topics I think are relevant to many of the audience here um, and, and some to, to others. So the Tavantnib study came out because Tavantnib, the CMET, it's thought to be a good target for TFE renal cell carcinoma because the TFE3 uh, gene uh, upregulates CMET. So this study was launched by Arcule and Daichi Sankyo. Andy Wagner in Boston was involved, myself and a handful of others. And we accrued uh, six, to six patients with TFE RCC total and didn't benefit at all, unfortunately. And I, I think part of it is this is a bad drug. And when I met in 2000, I'll tell you the Exitnip story in a minute, and I'll tell you the anti ADVL 1522 story as well. Um, we've had a bunch of other phase two studies. Cabozantinib is still open with some RCC patients that have enrolled and some other Wilms tumor studies. Um, Serafinib we have looked at as well. This is an example of the first half of the PPTC data that's xenograph data in mice, looking at various novel drugs and their activity. We do have representation and for Wilms tumor and for rhabdoid tumor. The red is a hit and the green is, is not. Um, AZD1480 is actually um, a JAK stat inhibitor. We don't think it worked that way. As you can see, there's no renal cell carcinoma models in this. There's no um, CCS, slip clear cell sarcoma models either. And that has been a gap with which many of us have been collaborating to improve. I did want to share the, the 1522 uh, story because um, this is a story that uh, Andy Woods, who's our, our patient liaison uh, on the COG Renal Tumor Committee, uh, he's, he had a child with Wilms, uh, and he was very active in helping make this happen. But this is a drug that targets CD56, and it's on the surface of a lot of cells, and it brings a chemo to it. It's called antibody drug conjugated therapy. And we had good data from the mouse models from the PPTC showing effect. And we had good expression data in a number of tumors, but the drug failed the adult trial. And um, this, is, this is an important discussion point because once it failed the adult trials, they lost interest and they didn't wanna support the study. But we had buy-in for multiple aspects. We had buy-in from CTEP, Malcolm Smith, really thought that the proof in principle from that preclinical data should be tested. The drug supply was gonna be there for a couple of years and just wasted. And then we had parent advocates calling senators and putting pressure on the NCI to make this happen. And that made a difference, it really did. And what happened was the NCI or CTEP took on the trial and sponsored it. And what they mean by took on the trial, they were responsible for drug distribution, whereas the industry typically does that. So we had a drug that was on the way out. Company didn't want to play, but they were willing to give the drug to the NCI. CTEP spent a few hundred thousand dollars of their own money to make it happen. And I think that they were interested to begin with. We were interested to begin with, but more importantly, parents spoke up, senators heard it, and it was a simple enough thing to push this over the edge to make the trial happen. So it's a good story because drug development for kids is not always easy. And I just, do, I just wanted to share that example of collaborative effort, advocacy, making an impact. I wish the drug worked better than it did. It didn't work well for Wilms, but it worked in a couple other models. One last slide before going into RCC full, out, full on is um, we do have international efforts. Mario van der Hoeveleberink at the Princess Maxima in Utrecht, Netherlands is the chair of the SIOP, the European Renal Tumor Study Group. Uh, she and I have been co-leading what's called the Harmonica, which is short for harmonization and collaboration on pediatric liver tumors since, I think it was about 2014 at one of the meetings where we decided it was a good idea and we conduct calls every other month. We've published a number of papers together 
uh, we have other leaders that are involved. Uh, one of the papers that we most recently published in July is on RCC. Uh, it's a narrative review. We have one of their junior uh, people in the Netherlands uh, write a draft, but we've also conducted written studies for the phase one, two group. We've, we've developed prioritization uh, models for, for the PPTC and CTEP um, and tried to give voice as an international community and also a willingness to conduct trials internationally. So this has been referred to by other cooperative groups as a success. I think that we can do more, but just so you're aware, we are trying our best to work with our European colleagues. I don't know how I got dubbed as the liaison, but I'm happy and honored to do it. And our next renal international pediatric renal tumor biology meeting, uh, we couldn't have it in person. I was planning on being in person this year. We have them every two years, so it's gonna be virtual and it's tomorrow. So that's the agenda. Myself, Manfred Gessler from Germany, uh, Mari Van de Hubel, uh, Conrad Fernandez is the chair and he's up in Nova Scotia. Arno Verschot is uh, in France and Elizabeth Mullen also from Boston. So we've got a wonderful group of junior biologists looking at genomics, looking at tumor models, organoids, and uh, uh, tumor heterogeneity, and, and, uh, and the RCC work will, will slip in there as well. Most of this is Wilms tumor related. So we continue to work internationally to try and work together. That is tomorrow. Registration is open, but I think, it, I think you have, I'm not sure if you have to be affiliated with an institution or not. So some of you uh, have been waiting to hear about this, others more the Wilms. Um, so TFE or translocation morphology renal cell carcinoma is now the subject of a formal prospective clinical study, which is the first time that is, has a trial devoted just to it. And it was a randomized three-arm study looking at anti-VEGF with exitinib, anti-PD-1 or immune therapy, which is NEVO or the combination. And before we get into that study, um, Dr. Jeff Dome and myself, and this goes back 16 years, we published a review of pediatric renal cell. And we found that the outcomes were fairly similar to adult renal cell. Although the staging systems were different, our stage four patients didn't do as well. And uh, there were some nuances, but what we did find are some, some hints. And this was early, this is before we knew what translocation renal cell carcinoma was. We found that the kids who had node positive disease that was completely resected without distant metastases, so it's called node positive metastases negative <clears throat> disease. In the kids, in the retrospective review, there was about 50 or so of those kids in, those, in the reports, 70% were alive and doing well, whereas in the adults, the literature suggests about only a quarter of those patients survived. So we right away figured, hey, wait, there's something different. <clears throat> the same year that we published this, um, um, the WHO came out with a formal, in 2004, description of translocation morphology renal cell. I moved to Cincinnati. One of the first thing I did with our pathologist, Margaret Collins, is we went back and reclassified all of our renal cell. Because like any, any uh, literature review of pediatric renal cell, our, it would all said, you know, the majority were clear cell, and it's not true, or papillary. Overwhelmingly, on the majority of the cases that we reclassified were, in fact, TFERCC, and we looked further in those that had node-positive non-metastatic disease in the young. It's a little different as you get older, even with the same biological disease, had good outcomes. And then we did a review of the literature there, and we found 15 or 16 kids, published this in 2008, with node-positive non-metastatic TFE type, and they did well. And this might explain this difference between adult RCC. Not the only explanation. Many of you know Peter Argani and Mark Ladani's publications describing the various fusion partners with TFE3 and with TFEB. There are a lot of them. The most common is the PRCC on the first chromosome and the ASPL on the 17th chromosome. TFE3 is on X. That's why it's called XP11.2, as Scott was alluding to. Now, this is a, a typical morphology. You see these these large, large bubbles. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, uh, but this is what's called voluminous cytoplasm. They have a very typical look. But when it's not as voluminous, this is why people will often call them clear cell. They don't know any better, and most pathology labs in the country still do not have TFE staining, and most do not do cytogenetics. So we still think the majority of these go missed. 
Well, we did an epidemiology report in kids through age 21 from our biology banking study, O3B2. And we looked at our first 120 RCCs enrolled. We now have over 200. 3.7% were RCC of the enrollments at the time. Median age was 12.9 years up to 22.1 years. And 47% were listed as TFE RCC from just central path review. 21% um, were not otherwise specified. Now a number of those have since been reclassified and I would refer you to a paper by Mariana Kajaiba in 2018 in cancer, redoing the data with over 200 of our RCC showing that um, that, that percent is, is right, but the, the NOS cases, not otherwise specified cases, are much lower now because we've been able to classify them into various categories. So we did prospectively study renal cell before, not specifically TFE, and the goal was to define uh, that prospectively that kids who had all their disease resected, including their lymph nodes, but didn't have any metastatic disease would do well without any adjuvant therapy, what we published retrospectively. And we tried to collect some data on treatment, but the data turned out to be too few and, and too low in quality. On this study, 51.4% of kids had the TFE type, more than half of the 68 patients that enrolled. And I didn't put it on this slide, but of the uh, 15 children with TFE renal cell carcinoma who fit the node positive metastasis negative category, 13 of them have not relapsed more than four years out. Two have relapsed. One, unfortunately, uh, did not survive, and one is alive at four years, uh, I believe still battling um, disease. So we did show an event-free survival more than 80% and an overall survival more than 90% without using medicine when the disease is resected. This was just published last week in cancer. I think it was September 14th. Um, so you can, you can pull the data now and look at it yourselves. Um, but we still do not recommend adjuvant therapy for those who have completely resected no positive disease. We are aware that the outcomes for the older cohorts with TFERCC tends to be a little worse than this. And people have hypothesized what age, maybe age 25 and lower or younger to when the lymph nodes become more prognostic. And we don't fully understand why that is, but at least in the younger patients, they do well. I showed this slide because this is where all the events were, all the relapses and progressions. And the major, almost all with the exception of two came in two categories, renal medullary carcinoma, which is another pediatric young adult cancer and TFE renal cell carcinoma. And this was a clear message to us that these are the two diseases that need to be formally studied. And not only that, that we have to partner with the adults to make some advances. So the conclusions are the TFE is the most common subtype. We can avoid adjuvant therapy in those who have resected disease, that we didn't have enough data to make any sense of the treatments beyond that, that we need to study TFE RCC more formally. So ARIEN 1721 is a randomized study. It is coordinated through the National Cancer Therapy Network. Uh, ECOG, SWOG, and Alliance all have study champions who should be representing the protocol in its amended version at the fall meetings. I just represented last week at COG. So it's open to all age groups. Um, we'll say the protocol journey has been long. It, was, it began when I had discussions back and, and I've only got a few slides left, so we'll leave time for discussion. But um, it began in 2012 when I was invited to the Kidney Cancer Association meeting to present our pediatric data. And they're like, oh, you guys have all this TFE stuff. And like, we need to, we need to work together. I remember it was Nazar Tanir uh, who approached me and we started working on it. And they all said, but it has to be a third generation VEGF inhibitor. It has to be third generation, it has to be exitinib. So I had to beg CTEP to allow us to study one more VEGF drugs. We'd already studied seven or eight in kids without an indication yet. Uh, and I did convince them be on the condition that we would have a trial with the adults later, another new drug initiative with advocacy involved. So we finished our phase one study and now we were able to do the phase two study. It was initially a phase two exitinib study. And by the time we got that ready, PD-1 was here and there was no appetite for an RCC study without a PD-1 inhibitor. So I got Merck and they were interested and then they kind of last minute left. Bristol Myers came in with Nevo and you know, six years later, we had a study that we opened. Uh, it was quite a journey. I think when you have a rare disease and you're pulling so many people together, um, and then 
the the ground shifts under you it can be it can be extra challenges throw the industry on top of that numbers feasibility but we did get it open um and the common theme in my experience with new drug initiatives is that you, you need a champion and you need to have advocacy and you need to have ctap and you need to work the system so you know about these drugs they're both fda approved and the combination of pd1 and vegf is now standard frontline for adult rcc we do not have data with pd1 and tfe rcc and i have my own biases about whether they're going to be as good as vegf or not but, um, we had a rough time getting accruals from the adult centers which i'll talk about in a minute and we amended it because they didn't have an appetite for a non-PD-1 arm to remove the exitinib arm, which I don't love, but we had to do it. We also amended it um, in a couple other ways recently, which I'll highlight in a minute. Endpoints are to establish the activity of these drugs in TFERCC, characterize the behavior across all age groups. We are doing immune biomarker work as well as creating a further tissue bank on this study. And we are going to be characterizing the disease. And we, were, we did get permission with a lot of arguing to add these questions to the case report forms. You have to argue to include data that costs money to characterize the disease. And pathology is going to be essentially reviewed retrospectively. It's available via consult prospectively. We are dose escalating the exit nib above, above the PEDS dose for the younger kids up to a certain max dose. And I do encourage dose intensification. I do believe there's a dose response in patients with TPRCC with VEGF targeted drugs. I think you do need to, for those who aren't developing hypertension or dose limiting toxicities, um, Brian Rainey published a lot of this work with Exitinib. I do, I've seen it myself where patients have progressed, we tweak the dose up and then they respond. Um, the Nevo has been amended to the Q4 weekly for the adult convenience. Each drug's given at full dose and the exposures are permitted. You have to have a valuable disease, measurable disease. So if it's all completely resected, you are not eligible. We did amend the study to permit one prior VEGF drug as long as it's not exitinib. You're not eligible if you had a prior PD1 drug. We anticipated accruing about 25 patients per year to our, our new design to 66 patients total, which would give us power to detect the difference in outcomes. And where are these patients supposed to come from? Well, 50 to 60% of 25 to 30 only adds up to a dozen or two each patients per year eligible. In the first year the trial opened, we had six patients enroll at children's oncology group sites, of which five were less than age 21. I think COG is doing what we expected it to do, meaning the kids who are eligible are finding it and they're rare and they're hard to find. In the adult world, if you ask Marston Linehan at the NCI, he'll tell you his data says 5% of all adult RCC is the TFE type. When you test everyone, the data ranges from 1% to 4%, which in the USA would correspond to 500 to 2,000 patients per year in the adults. We've had zero enrollments in ECOG Energy Alliance. And we did do the amendment recently. We are rebroadcasting. I'm happy to join you here to help raise awareness and solicit your help to raise awareness. We, it is open at 70 different centers with over 200 independent centers with 70 lead centers. A lot of the adults don't know it's open. I did get letters of support from some of the larger centers, so they should be aware. All the study champions are going back to them now in this re renewed effort to get enrollment going. We've also increased per case reimbursement through generosity of Pfizer, who really wants the trial to move forward uh, to better study exitinib in children. Uh, so the reimbursements to centers is more than what they typically get for a trial. It doesn't impact the patients, but sometimes the institutions have an impact. So the study is open and we need help with enrollment. There's a number of things we're doing to try and change that. I have to meet with the, the industry very shortly and they're gonna ask for modified enrollments. And this year is kind of our do or, do or die year. Um, Nick Costa is the vice chair, a urologic oncologist in Colorado. Colorado. Jeff Dome, the former renal tumor chair, and Conrad, the current chair, the entire renal tumor committee has been involved and supportive, as have many of you, via advocacy. And these are our contacts. And that's really what I had to say. I it went over the half hour, I think, but I do want to thank you for, for joining today. Um, this is the, the new Cincinnati Children's. Everything you see here is Cincinnati Children's. 
this isn't all new right now. We'll be opening in a, within a year. Uh, and with over 700 beds, we have over a million, million point five square feet of lab space. Um, and this is our Liberty campus where we have the only, one of two, the only pediatric proton facilities in the country and four gantries with a pediatric entry and an oncology clinic right above attached to a, to a, to a inpatient ward that's about 20 miles away from here. And I would welcome any questions uh, that you have. Okay, I'm just looking at the chat room now, but I am officially done, Scott, so I, I'm happy to yes. look at the chat. Yes, sir, thank you very much. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first from Walter Johnson, he's asking, are many parents of the children kidney cancer survivors, or are we seeing any, are we seeing any uh, link? So hereditary kidney cancer? You know, interestingly enough, in the Wilms tumor group, it's about one in 200 where there's a relative that had Wilms tumor. It's very rare to be genetic and where it's hereditary. Most of those genetic conditions are uh, sporadic, meaning they're acquired by, by, the, by the child, not passed down. In renal cell, uh, we've published this and it's in that report uh, from the 2015 in cancer as well as from the 2018, that actually cancer predisposition conditions such as von hippel lindau hereditary uh, CMED or hereditary papillary are actually exceedingly rare in pediatric patients. Um, there, I believe we had three VHL patients out of the 200 or so uh, patients that were identified through our national databank. Now, it could be that some of the older teenagers are presenting to adult programs and we're not capturing them. Um, Aside from that, there is the very rare hereditary MET, germline MET um, situation, but even there, we're not seeing them manifest in the pediatric ages. They still seem to be young adult to adult age onset. Nyla has a few questions. Um, do you have results from cabozantib studies? Nyla, great question. And um, the, the answer is no. Uh, I believe we've had four or five patients with RCC enroll as a total because that trial was not designed to focus on renal tumors. We got what's called a, a, a second tier uh, cohort, meaning once all the first tier cohorts complete accrual, they will close the trial independent of how many patients we've accrued. Um, I'm not sure how many of them are TFE RCC, nor have I seen the response data, nor am I allowed to see the response data. Um, I can point you to my most recent publication in uh, 2020 um, in Pediatric Blood and Cancer Reviews 2019, where I did publish on a couple kids who've had cabozantinib and a couple others that I'm aware of that have received it. And I'm happy to share my thoughts, um, but there, it's any, any thoughts that you're gonna hear from anybody, whether it's David up in Boston or somebody else, we're all working with anecdotes. And actually that's why I've created the registry, www.trri.org for TFE RCC of all ages to try and centralize knowledge because the clinical trials only capture a few patients at a time because they're usually lumped into non-clear cell RCC. And that's another reason why I think the 1721 study is so important is to prove that we can get together and study this disease. So I, I, I can share anecdotes uh, either offline or online um, and my impressions, uh, but I think centralizing knowledge is, is one of my, my key goals with both of those initiatives, both the registry and the trial. Uh, do you have any pointers on whether axitinib and Nevo Synergy is proving more effective than single agents axitinib and Nevo? Um, no. Um, Again, the, the enrollment to the clinical trial is six patients deep. Um, so I, I don't have avail, I, I, even though I'm the PI, I don't have access to response data. Um, and actually maybe one or two patients, I can tell you have been assigned to the combination. So there's nothing I can tell you from the trial beyond anecdote anyway. I, I'm not certain yet whether immune therapy works for this disease. I know the PDL one data in the tumors themselves. I've heard of an anecdote here and there. It, it, IL-2 interferon can stabilize, but I'm not sure PD-1 or CTLA-4 work. Um, people think that it's gonna be the stronger drug, but just because it's an RCC, but we have more data with VEGF. 
it's not great data. So I definitely understand people wanting to combine or explore uh, beyond that. But um, the, the adults data, um, Nyla, you know, does show that adding the VEGF to the PD-1 makes a difference in clear cell RCC. And it's not unreasonable for somebody who may have um, progressed on PD-1 or uh, to, to add in VEGF therapy. And then Linda asks, uh, with children, are there as many surgeries as there are with adults? Or is, is are, are drugs always the first uh, treatment yeah. of that? Or If it were up to me, they would have more surgeries, not because I'm mean, but because I'm kind. Um, this is a, a mis misperception by a lot of medical oncologists and surgical oncologists who deal with adults, and sometimes even parents themselves or patients. Kids tolerate these surgeries infinitely better than adults. You know, you go in for a, a thoracotomy to clear out lungs where you have to open up the lungs. The kids are out in four days off pain medicine and running around. You know, if it were me, I'd be laid up with fractured ribs and in pain for six weeks. Um, and the same is true with large abdominal explorations with lymph node clearance and even organ clearance. So we do uh, encourage early cytoreductive nephrectomy in kids. We think it, it, it we're never going to prove the data. We can argue the adult data. It's gone back and forth over this over the decades. But we, we I do think there's merit to debulking. I had recently a patient who was 17, who we, um, yeah, thank you for taking the share with, uh, who was 17, who had a met here that we removed, a large met here that we removed because it was fractured in pain, and, and the primary that we removed. And he's two years later and stable. And I don't think he would have been had we not been aggressive surgically and he healed from the surgeries within weeks. So I, we don't, we're not gentle when it comes to surgery for kids. Um, and then what are the chances that if you have RCC as a child that you will get it again as an adult or, or have it metastasized? So, uh, the the only data that we have is with TFE RCC, and many of you may be aware that there are reports of it coming back 20 years later. And whenever we publish our outcome data that's five years old, showing that you don't need adjuvant therapy if you resect all the lymph nodes and the disease, and 13 out of 15 didn't relapse by five years, we will find a reviewer that will quote the, the couple case reports out there of delayed recurrences, because we do know that some of the patients with TFERCC have a very indolent disease, and we don't know why cells hide somewhere and come back decades later. I think it's rare. I think it's I think it's fairly you know anytime it's happened, it's probably been published. Um, I, I, there are other variants of RCC where you can, you are at risk to the other kidney. I've never seen TFERCC occur in both kidneys. If any of you are aware of it, let me know. As far as I know, this is not a germline predisposition thing. Um, but there are environmental factors that can predispose to RCC, such as kidney transplant and other things where I have seen kidney cancer in both kidneys. Um, and then Nyla asks, does TRCC start in the womb or is it environmental? Now, that's a good question. I, I think it's environmental. And the reason I think that is that in children, one out of five kids who get it, and this is also true in some of the young adults, they have a history of a cancer before for which they had chemotherapy. So we do know that chemotherapy, it, the TFERCC 20% of the time is actually a secondary cancer. Now, one could argue that maybe it's the genetics that led someone to have two cancers. We think it's the genotoxic stress uh, from the chemo and from the, and the same could be said from the environment of causing, causing the TFE3 fusion to occur. Um, I've seen a kid who was one and a half years old have it, but most of the time it's in the teenage and, and, and young adults. I probably know half a dozen kids less than 10 which also argues against it being in the womb. There are no studies that I'm aware of where people have taken you know, the, uh, the, 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 the blot tests when you're born to, to look for the fusion like people have done with leukemia. And Leandre asks if ipilimumab and nivolumab combo doesn't work, which treatment is the next step? 
for RCC, um, in clinical trial, if you have anything available to you, um, the VEGF drugs do work. Um, they don't work for a long time, but they do work. They work better if you are aggressive with them uh, and support through side effects as best you can. And the other thing that I do use, we haven't published this yet, is radiation for areas of, of symptoms. We've done that about a half dozen times, and it does seem to work, unlike in clear cell RCC, which maybe not as reliable, but there's a lot of biology in TTRCC that's similar to sarcomas. As many of you know, the, the ASPS gene, which is the TX17 version, is the same gene that's, that's uh, fused with TT3 and alveolar soft part sarcoma. And some of the biology is more similar between those than TTRCC is with clear cell RCC. And we know that radiation works well for that, which is why we've, we've tried it. For, for example, if someone has a lymph node in the chest pressing on their airway or, or a tumor pressing on their, their spinal canal, we've, we've seen it, used it effectively, ameliorating symptoms and preventing those tumors from progressing for, for more than a year. Um, I, you know, there are tools in a toolkit. They're not the answers, unfortunately. I think we, we obviously need better therapy. The other thing, um, uh, I mean, I, I generally, for VEGF, use Exitinib first, but Sinitinib, dose increased. Uh, Cabazatinib, in my experience, is a bit more rough to tolerate. Um, and, um, but you know, those are the drugs that I recommend. Thank you I, I, I do have data with mTOR, and I don't think it works for this disease. I do know of a patient who's getting linvatinib with Everlimus, the mTOR combination, and is benefiting. I'm just not convinced yet what mTOR brings to the table. And then Wendy says, thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, her daughter is a stage four Wilms and a translocation RCC survivor. She feels so fortunate to have great minds working to help kids survive. She had many complications and lives with lifelong challenges, but overall is doing great. And Nyla is also thanking you for uh, your detailed talk and, and answers. Um, would be amazing uh, for it to be as high as Wilms, a cure for TRCC. To, to, to Wendy, I, thank you for sharing your story. I, you know, any, any positive that we can see is obviously most importantly, best for the child and their family, not a child anymore, and obvious positives. But th those stories do help fuel, fuel the engines of those of us who aren't touched the same way you all are, many of you are with your, with your, your family's lives, but we are touched with the privilege of taking the journey with you and your trust. And, um, and like you all, sometimes we need to lift up too. So love seeing the photos, the positive stories. Nyla, thank you for the encouragement. We are gonna to continue to work and, uh, and for the support we've received uh, from many of you. So, so thank you for those comments, I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank you one more time, Dr. Geller, for, for joining us today and sharing your, your insights and, and your expertise. Um, the, for anyone who missed a portion of this video, uh, we will be posting this on our website and social media by tomorrow. So you can you can find these videos if you go to jnfkidneycancer.org and you go to the education and support tab right here under videos, you will find um, past talks that we've had and interviews that we've had with different um, kidney cancer experts and caregivers and survivors and and uh, lots of people sharing their story and um, and you can also join us on Facebook um, and follow us there and if you'd like to sign up for any upcoming videos uh, that we're we're doing then you can do that also from our page the next one that we have is going to be on October 14th and uh, Jenny Spencer with fight the fatigue is going to be talking about the role exercise plays in uh, in helping you fight against cancer. So if you're interested in attending that, you can register for it on our website. Um, thanks again, Dr. Geller, and I, My I look forward to um, talking with you again another time. Have a great Thank day. Thank you, everyone.